Hello, friends and relatives, neighbors, natures, lovers, and friends of nature. We're in chapter two of Willpower, and like I said before, I don't necessarily condone everything I'm about to say because I haven't read it yet. It just seemed like an interesting book to read. Chapter two. Where does the power come in? Willpower come from. <laughs> Where does the power of willpower come from? Whether or not ingestion of food stuffed, uh, stuffs with preservatives and sugar and high content causes you to alter your personality somehow or causes you to act in an aggressive manner, I don't know. But I'm not going to suggest to you for a minute that that occurs. But there is a minority opinion in psychiatric fields that there is some connection. Defense's closing argument in the trial of Dan White, the murderer whose taste for junk food inspired the term Twinkie Defense. Uh, here's another quote. I have terrible PMS, so I just went a little crazy. Actress Melanie Griffith explaining why she had filed for divorce from Don Johnson, only to immediately withdraw it. If willpower isn't just a metaphor, if there is a power driving this virtue, where does it come from? The answer emerged by accident from a failed experiment inspired by Mardi Gras and other carnivals held on the eve of Lent. Interesting. Mardi Gras means Fat Tuesday. The day before Ash Wednesday. When people prepare for a season of fasting and self-sacrifice by shamelessly indulging their desires. In some places, it's known as Pancake Day and begins with all-you-can-eat flapjack breakfast at churches. Bakers honor the occasion by producing special treats. The names of the delicacies vary from culture to culture, but the recipes generally involve gargantuan quantities of sugar, eggs, flour, butter, and lard, and the gluttony is just the beginning. From Venice to New Orleans to Rio de Janeiro, revelers move on to more interesting vices, sometimes under the cover of traditional masks, but often just letting it all hang out. It's the one day you can strut down the street with a beaded headdress and nothing else, proudly parading to cheers from drunks. Losing self-control becomes a virtue. In Mexico, married men are officially granted one day of liberty from their obligations on what's called El Dia del Marido Oprimido, Marido Oprimido, the day of the oppressed husband. On the eve of Lent, even the sternest Anglo-Saxon churchgoers are in a forgiving mood. They call it Shrove Tuesday, derived from the verb shrive, which means to receive absolution for sins. It's all rather confusing from a theological standpoint. Why would the clergy encourage public fights with a package of pre-approved absolution? Why reward premeditated sinning? Why would a merciful, benevolent God encourage so many already overweight mortals to stuff themselves with deep-fried dough? But to psychologists, there was a certain logic to it. By relaxing before Lent, perhaps people could store up the willpower necessary to sustain themselves through weeks of self-denial. The Mardi Gras theory, as it was known, was never as popular with scientists as it was with pancake eaters and peacock headdresses, but it seemed worth an experiment. In place of Fat Tuesday breakfast, the chef's and uh, Baumeister's lab whipped up lusciously thick ice cream milkshakes for a group of subjects who were resting in between two laboratory tasks requiring willpower. Meanwhile, the less fortunate subjects in other groups had to spend the interval reading dull, out-of-date magazines or drinking a large, tasteless concoction of low-fat dairy glop that was rated even less enjoyable than old magazines just as predicted by the Mardi Gras theory. The ice cream did seem to strengthen willpower by helping people perform better than expected on the next, ta next task. Fortified by the milkshake, they had more self-control than did the unlucky subjects who'd been stuck reading the old magazines. So far, so good. But it turned out that the joyless drink of glop worked just as well, which meant that building willpower didn't require happy self-indulgence. The Mardi Gras theory looked wrong. Besides tragically removing an excuse for romping through the streets of New Orleans. The result was embarrassing for the researchers. Uh, Matthew Galliat, the graduate student who run the study, stood looking glumly at his shoes. He told Baumeister about the fiasco. Baumeister tried to be optimistic. Maybe the study wasn't a, a failure. Something had happened, after all. They'd succeeded in eliminating the ego depletion effect. In initiating. In eliminating the, the ego depletion effect. The problem was that They'd done 
they, they'd succeeded too well. Even the tasteless milkshake had done the job. But how? The researchers begin to consider another possible explanation for the boost in self-control. If it wasn't pleasure, could it be the calories? At first, the idea seemed a bit daft. Why should drinking some low-fat dairy concoction improve performance on a lab task? For decades, psychologists have been studying performance on mental tasks without worrying about its being affected by a glass of milk. They like to envision the human mind as a computer focusing on the way it processed information. In their eagerness to chart the human equivalent of the computer's chip and circuits, most psychologists neglected one mundane but essential part of the machine, the power cord. Chips and circuit boards are useless without a source of energy. So is the brain. It took psychologists a while to realize this, and the revelation came not from computer models, but from biology. The transformation of psychology based on ideas from biology was one of the major developments of the late 20th century. Some researchers found that genes had, excuse me, important effects on personality and intelligence. I'm going to take a sip of water. Pardon the interruption. Let's get back to it. Uh, as some researchers have found that genes had important effects on personality and intelligence. Others began to show that sexual and romantic behavior conformed to predictions from evolutionary theory and resembled aspects of behavior in many animal species. Neuroscientists began to map out brain processes. Others found how hormones altered behavior. Psychologists were reminded over and over that the human mind exists in a biological body. This newly emerging emphasis on biology made the milkshake experimenters think twice before dismissing the results. Before writing off the, that dairy glop, they figured maybe they should take a look at the, its ingredients and start paying attention to stories from people like Jim Turner. Brain fuel. The comedian Jim Turner has played dozens of roles in films and television series like The Football Star turned sports agent on HBO's Arliss series, but his most dramatic performance was reserved for his wife. It occurred the night he had a dream in which he was responsible for righting all the world's wrongs. It was an exhausting duty, even in a dream, but then he discovered teleportation to travel anywhere. All he had to do was think of the place and he'd magically appear there. He went back to his old home in Iowa, to New York, to Greece, even to the moon. When he woke up, he was convinced he still possessed this power. He generously... Tried to teach it to his wife by shouting over and over, You think it, you go there, and you be there. His wife had a better plan. Knowing he was a diabetic, she tried to get him to drink some fruit juice. He was still so crazed that he poured some of it over his face, got up, and then demonstrated his power by doing a somersault in the air and landing back on the bed. Finally, much to our relief, the juice kicked in, and he calmed down. Or at least, that was how it looked to his wife. As if the maniac frenzy had subsided. But in fact, he hadn't been sedated. Quite the reverse. The sugar, the juice of sugar had given him extra energy. More precisely, the energy in the juice was converted to glucose. The simple sugar manufactured in the body from all kinds of foods. Not just sweet ones. The glucose produced by digestion goes into the bloodstream and is pumped throughout the body. The muscles, not surprisingly, use plenty of glucose. As do the heart and liver. The immune system uses large quantities, but only sporadically. When you're relatively healthy, your immune system may only use um, a relatively small amount of glucose. But when your body's fighting off a cold, it may consume gobs of it. That's why sick people sleep so much. Their body uses all the energy it can to fight the disease. And it can't spare much for exercising, making love, or arguing. It can't even do much thinking. A process that requires plenty full glucose in the bloodstream. The glucose itself doesn't enter the brain, but it's converted into neurotransmitters, which are the chemicals that your brain cells use to send signals. If you ran out of neurotransmitters, you'd stop thinking. The link between glucose and self-control appeared in studies of people with hypoglycemia, the tendency to have low blood sugar. Researchers noted that hypoglycemics were more likely than the average person to have trouble concentrating and controlling their negative emotions when provoked. Overall, they tended to be more anxious and less happy than average. Hypoglycemia was also reported to be unusually prevalent among criminals and other violent persons. And to some creative defense attorney 
uh, some creative defense attorneys brought the low blood sugar research into court. The issue became notorious during the 1979 trial of Dan White for the assassination of two city officials in San Francisco, Mayor George Moscone uh, and Harvey Milk. Forgive me if I got the, I think I got those names right. Moscone, Moscone, I, don't, I never heard of him until just now. A member of the Board of uh, Supervisors, oh, this is Harvey Milk. Now, they made a movie out of this. And the most prominent openly gay politician in America. When a psychiat- a psychiatrist testified for the defense, testifying for the defense cited, cited White's consumption of Twinkies and other junk food in the days before the murders, journalists mocked White for trying to excuse himself with a Twinkie defense. In fact, White's chief defense wasn't based on the argument that the Twinkies turned him murderous by causing his blood sugar levels to quickly spike and crash. His attorneys argued that he deserved mercy because he suffered from diminished capacity due to severe depression and they presented his junk food consumption along with other changes in habits as evidence of his depression not as the cause of it but when white received a relatively light sentence the popular wisdom became that the twinkie defense had worked and the public was understandably outraged other defense attorneys actually did argue with limited success that their clients blood sugar problems should be taken into account whatever the legal or moral merits of the argument there certainly was scientific data showing a correlation between blood sugar and criminal behavior one study found that below average glucose levels in uh, 90 percent of the juvenile delinquents recently taken into custody 90 percent other studies reported that People with hypoglycemia were more likely to be convicted of a wide variety of offenses, traffic violations, public profanity, shoplifting, destruction of property, exhibitionism, public masturbation, embezzlement, arson, spouse abuse, and child abuse. In one remarkable study, researchers in Finland went into a prison to measure the glucose tolerance of convicts who were about to be released. Then the scientists kept track of which ones went on to commit new crimes. Obviously, there are many factors that can influence whether an ex-con goes straight. Peer pressure, marriage, employment, prospects, drug use. Yet, just by looking at the response to the glucose test, the researchers were able to predict with greater than 80% accuracy which convicts would go on to commit violent crimes. These men apparently had less self-control because of their impaired glucose tolerance. A condition in which the body has trouble converting food into usable energy. The food gets converted into glucose, but the glucose in the bloodstream doesn't get absorbed as it circulates. The result is often a surplus of glucose in the bloodstream, which might sound beneficial, but it's like having plenty of firewood and no matches. The glucose remains there uselessly rather than being converted into brain and muscle activity. If the excess glucose reaches a sufficiently high level, the condition is labeled diabetes. Most diabetics aren't criminals, obviously. Most keep themselves and their glucose levels under control by monitoring themselves and using insulin when necessary. Like Jim Turner, one of the rare actors to make a good living in Hollywood, they can succeed in the most difficult endeavors. But they do face above-average challenges, particularly if they don't monitor themselves carefully. Researchers testing personality have found that Diabetics tend to be more impulsive and have more explosive temperaments than other people their age. They're more likely to get distracted while working on a time-consuming task. They have more problems with alcohol abuse, anxiety, and depression. In hospitals and other institutions, diabetics throw more tantrums than other patients. In everyday life, stressful conditions seem to be harder on diabetics. Coping with stress typically takes self-control, and that's difficult if your body isn't providing your brain with enough fuel. One of those paragraphs I didn't necessarily agree with, so I read it funny. Jim Turner deals with his self-control problems directly and hilariously in a one-man show called Diabetes, My Struggle with Jim Turner. He recalls moments like the argument with his teenage son that ended with him, ostensibly the adult, getting so mad that he went outside and kicked a permanent dent into the family car. There are many times, Turner says, when my son can see that I am not in control, when he has to force me to drink some juice. When he's afraid that I'm just not there. I'm just not there. Turner doesn't use any version of the Twinkie defense to excuse the debt. And he doesn't feel sorry for himself either. On the whole, he keeps his diabetes under control and says the disease hasn't stopped him from being happy and fulfilling his dreams. Except for that one about teleportation. But he also recognized 
the emotional consequences of glucose. There are so many little moments of connection that I've missed, he says, that I wasn't a available to my son because I was busy dealing with a low blood sugar episode and too overwhelmed trying to figure out what was going on. It's the single biggest heartbreak of this disease. What exactly happens to Turner in these moments, during those moments? You can't draw definitive conclusions from any anecdote or even from the large studies showing above average problems with self-control among diabetics and other groups of people. Correlation is not causation. In social science, the strongest conclusions are permitted only when researchers use experiments that randomly assign people among different treatment conditions so that the individual differences even out. Some people arrive at the experiment happier than others or more aggressive or more preoccupied and distracted. There's no way to guarantee the average person in one experimental condition is the same as the average person in another experimental condition, except by counting on the law of averages. If the researchers randomly assign people among treatment and control groups, the differences tend to average out. For example, if you wanted to test the effects of glucose on aggression, You'd have to consider that some people are already aggressive, while others are peaceful and gentle. To show that glucose caused the aggressiveness, you'd want about an equal number of aggressive people in the glucose and, the in, and in the no-glucose conditions. And also equal number of pacifists. Random assignment usually does this pretty well. Once you've got representative groups of people, you can see how they're affected by different treatments. Nutritionists use this method during food experiments at elementary schools all the children in the class were told to skip breakfast one morning and then by random assignment half of the children were given a good breakfast at school the others got nothing during the first part of the morning well just might i say the glory of science some children got nothing during the first part of the morning the children who got breakfast learned more and misbehaved less as judged by monitors who didn't know which children had eaten. Then, after the students were given a healthy snack in the middle of the morning, the differences disappeared as if by magic. After all the students were given the, the healthy snack. The magic ingredient was isolated in other experiments by measuring glucose levels in people before and after doing simple tasks. Like watching a video in which a series of words flashed at the bottom of the screen. Simple people, some people were told to ignore the words Others were free to relax and watch whatever they wanted. Afterwards, glucose levels were measured again, and there was a big difference. Levels remained constant in the relaxed viewers, but dropped significantly in the people who were trying to avoid the words. That seemingly small exercise of self-control was associated with a big drop in the brain's fuel of glucose. To establish cause and effect, the researchers tried refueling the brain in a series of experiments involving lemonade mixed either with sugar or with a diet sweetener. The strong taste of the lemon made it hard for the tasters to know whether real sugar or diet sweetener was used. The sugar gave them a quick burst of glucose, though not for long, so the experimenters needed to get to the point pretty soon. The diet sweeteners didn't furnish any glucose or indeed any nutrition at all. The effects of the drinks showed up clearly in a study of aggression among people playing a computer game. At first, the game seemed reasonable, but it soon became impossibly difficult. Everyone got frustrated as the game went on, but the one who got a sugar-filled drink, the group that got the sugar-filled drink, managed to grumble quietly and keep playing. The others started, or the one who got a sugary-filled drink managed to grumble quietly and keep playing. The others started cursing aloud and banging the computer, and when by prearranged script the experimenter made an insulting remark about their performance the glucose deprived people were much more likely to get angry no glucose no willpower the pattern showed up time and time again as researchers tested more people in more situations they even tested dogs while self-control is a distinctively human trait in the sense that we've developed it so extensively in the process of becoming cultural animals, it's not unique to our species. Other social animals require at least some degree of self-control to get along with one another. And dogs, because they live with humans, must often learn to bring their behavior in line with what must seem to them to be absurd and arbitrary rules, like the ban on sniffing the crotches of house guests, at least the human ones. 
So mimic the human studies, the experimenters first depleted the willpower of one group of dogs by having each dog obey, sit, and stay commands from its owner for 10 minutes. A control group of dogs was simply left alone for 10 minutes in cages, uh, where they had no choice but to remain there, did, therefore didn't have to exercise any self-control. Then all the dogs were given a familiar toy, a familiar toy, with a sausage treat inside it. All the dogs had played with this toy in the past and successfully extracted the treat, but for the experiment, the toy was rigged so that the sausage could not be extracted. The control group of dogs spent several minutes trying to extract it, but the dogs who'd had to obey the commands gave up in less than a minute. It was the familiar ego depletion effect, and the canine cure turned out to be familiar too. In a follow-up study, when the dogs were given different drinks, the drinks with the sugar restored the willpower of the dogs who'd had to obey the commands. Newly fortified, they persisted with the toy just as long as the dogs had been in cages. The artificially sweetened drinks had no effect, as usual. Despite all these findings, the growing community of brain researchers still had some reservations about the glucose connection. Some skeptics pointed out that the brain's overall use of energy remains about the same, regardless of what one is doing. Which doesn't square easily with the notion of depleted energy. Among the skeptics was Todd Heatherton, who had worked with Baumeister early in his career and eventually wound up at Dartmouth, where he became a pioneer in what is called social neuroscience. The study of links between brain processes and social behaviors. Neuroscience. Neuroscience. He believed in ego depletion, but the glucose findings just didn't seem to add up. Heatherton decided on an ambitious test of theory. He and his colleagues recruited dieters and measured their reactions to pictures of food. Then ego depletion was induced by asking everyone to refrain from laughing while watching a comedy video. After that, the researchers again tested how their brains reacted to pictures of food as compared with non-food pictures. Earlier work by Heatherton and Kate Demos, I think it's Demos or Demos, Kate Demos, uh, Demos maybe, D-E-M-O-S, had shown that these pictures produced for various reactions in key brain sites such as the nucleus, acubens, and the amygdala. These same reactions were found again. Among dieters, depletion caused an increase in activity in the nucleus, uh, acubens, accumbens, accumbens, I'll get there one day when I become a scientist, and a corresponding decrease in the amygdala. The crucial change in this experiment involved a manipulation of glucose. Some people drank lemonade sweetened with sugar, which sent glucose flooding through the bloodstream and presumably into the brain. Dramatically, Heatherton announced the results during his speech, accepting the leadership of the Society for Personality and the Social Psychology, uh, a society for personality and social psychology, the world's largest group of social psychologists, in his presidential address at the annual meeting in 2011 in San Antonio. Heatherton reported that the glucose levels, or the glucose, reversed the brain changes wrought with depletion, a finding he said that thoroughly surprised him. Baumeister, sitting in the audience to watch his protege enjoy that moment of glory as society president, recalled his own surprise when his own lab found, had first found the links to glucose, Heatherton's results did much more than provide additional confirmation that glucose is a vital part of willpower. They helped resolve the puzzle over how glucose could work without global changes in the brain's energy use. Apparently, ego depletion shifts activity from one part of the brain to another. Your brain does not stop working when glucose is low. It stops doing some things and starts doing others. That may help explain why depleted people feel things more intensely than normal. Certain parts of the brain go into high gear, just as others taper off. As the body uses glucose during self-control, it starts to crave sweet things to eat, which is bad news for people hoping to use their self-control to avoid sweets. When people have more demands for self-control in their daily lives, they hunger for sweets increases. It's not a simple matter of wanting all food more. They seem to be specifically hungry for sweet sweets. In the lab, students who have just performed a self-control task eat more sweet snacks, but not other salty snacks. Even just expecting to have to exert self-control seems to make people hungry for sweet foods. All these results don't offer a rationale for, for, for providing sugar fixes to anyone. 
human or canine outside the laboratory. The body uh, may crave sweets as the quickest way to get energy, but low sugar, high protein foods and other nutritious fare work just as well, albeit more slowly. Still, the discovery of the glucose effect does point to some useful techniques for self-control. It also offers a solution to a long-standing human mystery. Why is chocolate so appealing on certain days of the month? Inner demons. Whenever you think of Jennifer Love Hewitt's acting ability, you have to give her credit for originality when she was cast in a film version of The Devil and Daniel Webster. She shared star billing with Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin, which would have been a daunting enough proposition for any young actress. But she also had the challenge of playing the devil. If your goal, as drama coaches say, is to inhabit the character, a demon poses more difficulties than, say, a police officer. You can't do a field research by riding around in a squad car with Satan. But Hewitt came up with an alternative method of role prep. I started, playing close atten- I started paying close attention to myself and how I felt when I had PMS. She said, that's what formed my basis for playing Satan. If that strikes you as a singularly dark view, a singularly dark view of premenstrual syndrome, you haven't spent much time at PMSCentral.com and the other websites where women swap remedies and stories that joke about PMS, that, J- that PMS stands for psychotic mood shift or simply pass my shotgun or they share genuine PMS stories like this one. It ruins a large portion of my life. I have swollen, puffy eyes. I can't think straight. I make wrong decisions. Ugly emotional outbursts. Irrationally thinking. Irrational thinking purchases I have to return. Overspending. Quit jobs. Extremely tired. Cranky. Crying. Extremely emotional sensitivity. Uh, extreme emotional sensitivity. Body aches all over. All over. Nerve pain. Blank staring. That not here feeling. I hope I did that story justice. That not here feeling. I mean, good God, what it must be like. PMS has been blamed for everything from chocolate binges. It also stands for provide me with sweets to murder. After Marge, uh, or is it Marg? M-A-R-G? Marg? Marge? Uh, Helgenberger, a star of the CSI television show, was photographed at an awards dinner with oddly colored hair. She explained that shade was known as PMS pink. I was totally PMSing that day. I went crazy. What did I think? I was going to Get it with pink hair and CSI. The word crazy was also used by Melanie Griffith in diagnosing the PMS state that drove her to file for divorce and then abruptly change her mind, although her publicist preferred to use more clinical terms, calling it an impulsive act that occurred during a moment of frustration and anger. Over and over, women describe being mysteriously overcome by impulses that seem weirdly alien. These dark mood swings have also mystified scientists. To evolutionary psychologists, it seems especially counterproductive for a woman in her childbearing years not to get along with the people around her. Isn't empathy a crucial skill for raising children? Isn't it useful to maintain good relations with a mate providing child support? Some scientists noting that a woman reaches this premenstrual phase of the cycle only if she wasn't impregnated during the earlier ovulation phase of speculated that natural selection favored women who became dissatisfied with infertile men, thereby liberating themselves to seek another mate. That hypothesis certainly jibes with another name that women give to PMS, pack my stuff, but it's not clear that the evolutionary benefits would have outweighed the costs or that such Selective pressures even operated on the ancient savanna. For our hunter-gatherer ancestors, PMS was presumably less of a problem because women spent more of their lives either being pregnant or breastfeeding children. In any case, it's not a solid psychological explanation for... Uh, that's, there's now a, psycho, uh, a solid psychological explanation for PMS that doesn't involve any mysterious alien impulses. During this premenstrual part of the cycle, which is called the luteal, luteal phase, the female body starts channeling a high amount of its energy to the ovaries and to related activities like producing extra quantities of female hormones. As more energy and glucose are diverted to the reproductive system, there's less available for the rest of the body, which responds by craving more fuel. Chocolate and other sweets are immediately appealing because they provide instant glucose. But any kind of food can help, which is why women report more food cravings and tend to eat more. 
One study found that the average woman eats about 810 calories at lunch during this time, which is about 170 calories more than what she eats at lunch during the rest of the month. But most women still aren't getting enough extra calories. The typical woman in a modern, thin, conscious society like America does not take in enough extra food su to supply the body's increased demands for glucose during those few days each month. When there isn't enough energy to go around, the body has to ration it. And the reproductive system takes priority, leaving less glucose available for willpower. As a general rule, women are less likely than men to suffer from lapses of self-control, but their self-control problems do worsen during the luteal phase. I think it's luteal, 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 cool word, L-U-T-E-A-L phase. As women, uh, they, they, their self-control problems do worsen during the luteal phase, as studies have repeatedly shown. During this phase, women uh, spend more money uh, make more, and make more impulsive purchases than at other times. They smoke more cigarettes, they drink more alcohol, and not just because they enjoy more drinks. The increases especially likely for women who have a drinking problem or uh, a family history of alcoholism. During this luteal phase, women are more liable to go on drinking binges uh, or more liable to go on drinking binges or abuse cocaine than other drugs and other drugs. PMS, it's not a matter of one specific behavior problem cropping up. Instead, self-control seems to fail across the board, letting all sorts of problems increase. One drug isn't used more frequently is marijuana. And that exception is revealing. Unlike cocaine and opiates, marijuana is not a drug of escape or euphoria. Marijuana merely intensifies what you're already feeling. PMS feels bad and a drug that intensifies the feeling isn't going to be attractive. Moreover, marijuana doesn't produce the same of sort of addictive cravings as nicotine, uh, alcohol, cocaine, and other drugs, so a lessening of overall self-control wouldn't make a marijuana user more vulnerable to those kinds of temptations. Researchers have found that women who are prone to PMS miss twice as many days of work as other women do. Some of those missed days are due to, no doubt, to the physical pain associated with PMS, but some of the absenteeism is probably related to self-control. Following rules is harder when your body's short of glucose. Inside women's prisons, disciplinary problems based on breaking prison rules are highest among women who are at the luteal phase of their cycle. Violent, aggressive acts, legal or illegal, reach a peak among PMS sufferers during the luteal phase. To be sure, only a few women turn violent at any time, but many report emotional changes during the luteal phase. Luteal phase. Uh, studies have reported documented increase in emotional outbursts and distress at this time. Women have more conflicts with spouses, really, and other relationship partners, as well as with colleagues at work. They become less sociable and often prefer to be alone, which may be an effective strategy of avoiding conflicts that would arise from interacting. The standard explanation, the standard explanation for PMS has been that the luteal phase directly causes negative emotions, but that explanation doesn't really fit the data. Women aren't uniformly affected by negative emotions. When Amanda Palmer was posing as a living statue in Harvard Square, she found that PMS weakened her self-control because it liberated both positive and negative feelings. I'm prone to being way more sensitive and likely to cry when I'm PMSing, and that translated right into my statue work if something emotional happened Palmer recalls, something emotional could be as simple as, nobody walked by and looked at me for 10 minutes, and therefore the world was a cold and lonely place and no one loved me. The other extreme would be a 95-year-old man hobbling up to me at the rate of one mile per hour and taking five minutes to get a folded $5 bill out of his wallet and put it in my can and look up at me with his wizened, lonely eyes. I would just lose it. I'd try to transmit the largest concentration of love I could possibly transmit without speaking or moving my face. Her experience is fairly typical of what other women report during the luteal phase. They're affected by a variety of feelings, and their problems often arise from a strong reaction to some event. They say they don't want to get upset, but they can't seem to stop themselves from getting worked up over minor things. They're not consciously aware that their body has abruptly cut the fuel supply for self-control, so they're surprised that normal controls don't work as usual. It feels to many women as if life's stress has increased. They report more negative events and fewer positive events occurring during this luteal phase, but the outside world doesn't predictably change for a few days every month. 
If a woman feels less capable than usual of handling her problems, she'll be more stressed out. If PMS weakens her control over her emotions, then the same misfortune is more upsetting. The same task at work is more of a challenge if she doesn't have as much energy to available to focus her attention. In carefully controlled laboratory tests requiring concentration, women in their luteal phase performed worse than women at other stages of the menstrual cycle. And these effects were found for a general sample of women, not just PMS sufferers. Whether or not they felt the acute symptoms of PMS, their bodies were short of glucose. We don't want to exaggerate these problems because most women cope quite well with PMS at work and at home. And we certainly don't want to suggest that women have a weaker willpower than men. To repeat, women on the whole have fewer problems with self-control than men. They commit fewer violent crimes or less likely to become alcoholics or drug addicts. Girls' superior self-control is probably one reason they get better grades in school than boys do. The, only, the point is only that self-control is tied into the body's rhythms and the fluctuations in its energy supply. A woman with the self-control of a saint may become a tiny bit less saintly during the luteal phase. PMS, like hypoglycemia and diabetes, make a conveniently clear-cut example of what happens when the body is short of glucose. And everyone, male or female, diabetic or non-diabetic, runs low on glucose at times. We all succumb to frustration and anger. We all sometimes feel beset by insoluble problems and overcome by impulses that seem alien, if not satanic. Usually, though, the problem is within. It's not that the world suddenly turned cruel. It's not that Lucifer is tormenting us with dark new temptations and impulses. It's that we're less capable of dealing with ordinary impulses and long-standing problems. The provocations can be real enough. You may well have reason to get angry at your boss or reconsider your marriage. Melanie Griffith eventually did get divorced from Don Johnson. But you won't make much progress on those other problems until you control your own emotions. And that starts with controlling your glucose. Eat your way to willpower. Now that we've surveyed the problem, problems caused by the lack of glucose, by lack of glucose, we can turn to solutions. And to cheerier topics like good meals and long naps, here's some lessons and strategies for putting glucose to work for you. Feed the beast! By beast, we don't mean Beelzebub, right? The Z comes before the E, I get it. We mean the potential demon inside you or anyone spending time with you. Glucose depletion can turn the most charming companion into a monster. The old advice about eating a good breakfast applies all day long, uh, uh, particularly on days when you're physically or mentally stressed. If you have a test, an important meeting, or a vital project, don't take it on without glucose. Don't get into an argument with your boss four hours after lunch. Don't thrash out serious problems with your partner just before dinner. When you're on a romantic trip across Europe, don't drive into a walled medieval town at 7 p.m. and try to navigate to your hotel on an empty stomach. Your car can probably survive the cobblestone maze, but your relationship might not. Above all, don't skimp on calories when you're trying to deal with more serious problems than being overweight. If you're a smoker, don't try quitting while you're also on a diet. In fact, to quit, you might even consider adding some calories because part of what seems to be a craving for a cigarette might actually be a craving for food once you're no longer suppressing your appetite with nicotine. When researchers have given sugar tablets to smokers trying to quit, sometimes the extra glucose has led to higher rates of success, particularly uh, when the sugar tablets were combined with other therapies like the nicotine patch. Sugar works in the lab, not in your diet. It's a bit ironic that self-control researchers are so fond of giving sugar to experimental subjects, given how many of those people wish for the willpower to resist sweets. But the scientists are doing it just for the short-term convenience. A uh, sugar-filled drink provides a quick rise in energy that enables researcher experimenters to observe the effects of glucose in a short period of time. Neither the researchers nor the experimental subjects want to wait around for an hour for the body to digest something more complex like protein. There might be times when you could use sugar to boost your self-control right before a brief challenge like a math test or a track meet. 
if you've just quit smoking. You might use a sweet lozenge as an emergency stopgap against a sudden craving for a cigarette. But a sugar spike is promptly followed by a crash that leaves you feeling more depleted. So it's not a good long-term strategy. We're certainly not recommending that you switch from diet sodas to sugar-filled drinks or to sweet snacks in general. It may be true, as researchers found, that drinks with sugar in them will temporarily diminish the symptoms of PMS. But outside the lab, you're better off heeding the observation made by the singer Mary J. Blige when discussing her PMS and its attendant mood swings and shopping sprees. Sugar makes it worse. When you eat, go for the slow burn. The body converts just about all sorts of food into glucose, but at different rates. Foods that are converted quickly are said to have a high glycemic index. Uh, these include starchy carbohydrates like white bread, potatoes, white rice, and plenty of offerings on snack racks and fast food counters. I was going to say and crap like that, but that's not what the book says. They say and fast food counters. Uh, uh, plenty of offerings, snacks, racks, and fast food counters. Eating them produces boom and bust cycles, foods with high glycemic index, uh, leaving you short on glucose and self-control. And too often, unable to resist the body's craving for quick hits of starch and sugar from donuts and candy. Those all-you-can-eat pancake breakfasts on Fat Tuesday may make for wilder parades, but they're not all that useful the rest of the year. To maintain steady self-control, you're better off eating foods with a low glycemic index. Most vegetables, nuts like peanuts and cashews, many raw fruits like apples, blueberries, and pears, cheese, fish, meat, olive oil, and other good fats. These low glycemic foods may also help keep you slim. The benefits of the right diet have shown up in studies of women with PMS who report fewer symptoms when they're eating healthier foods. There also has been a successful series of experiments carried out with thousands of teenagers in correctional institutions. After the institutions replaced some of the sugary foods and refi refined carbohydrates with fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, there was a sharp decline in escape attempts, violence, and other problems. Wow. When you're sick, save your glucose for your immune system. The next time you're preparing to drag your aching body to work, here's something to consider. Driving a car with a bad cold has been found to be even more dangerous than driving when mildly intoxicated. That's because your immune system is using so much of your glucose to fight the cold that there's not enough left for your brain. If you're too glucose deprived to do something as simple as driving a car, how much use are you gonna be in the office, assuming you make it there safely? Sometimes the job has to be muddled through, but don't trust the glucose deprived brain for anything important. If you simply can't miss a meeting at work, try to avoid any topics that will strain your self-control. If there's a make or break project under your supervision, don't make any irrevocable decisions. And don't expect peak performance from others who are under the weather. If your child has a cold on the day of the SAT test, reschedule it. Whether you, when you're tired, sleep. We shouldn't need to be told something so obvious, but cranky toddlers aren't the only ones who resist much needed naps. Adults routinely shortchange themselves on sleep and the result is less self-control. By resting, we reduce the body's demands for glucose. And we also improve its overall ability to make use of the glucose in the bloodstream. Sleep deprivation has been shown to impair the processing of glucose which produces immediate consequences for self-control and, over the long term, a higher risk of diabetes. A recent study found that workers who were not getting enough sleep were more prone than others to engage in unethical conduct on the job, as rated by their supervisors and others. For example, they were more likely than others to take credit for work done by somebody else in a laboratory experiment offering test takers the chance to win cash. Students who had not slept enough were more likely than the others than others to take advantage of an opportunity to cheat. Not getting enough sleep has assorted bad effects on mind and body. Hidden among these is the weakening of self-control and related processes like decision making. To get the most out of your willpower, use it to set aside enough time to sleep. 
You'll behave better the next day and sleep more easily the next night. End of chapter two.